COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, and this name is very descriptive. It is a chronic condition that involves the obstruction of the airway. One thing we need to know about COPD is that it is a progressive disease. So this means that the damage done by COPD is irreversible. We can only maintain or slow down the deterioration, but we can never have full recovery once we reach the stage where COPD is diagnosed. Therefore, patients with COPD will have decreased pulmonary function for the long term, and this will impact their quality of life. There are two types of COPD. One is called bronchitis, which involves the inflammation of the bronchial tubes. The other is called emphysema, and in this disease, the alveoli of the lung are destroyed. So thinking about the structure or the anatomy of the lungs and the airway, the bronchial tubes are in the middle, so they're between the alveoli and the trachea, whereas the alveoli, they are the small air sacs at the end of the airways, so they are affected. So these are two conditions affecting different parts of the respiratory system that are under the umbrella of COPD. To diagnose COPD, we need to check for lung function by measuring FEV1. And this stands for forced expiratory volume in one second. We can also assess forced vital capacity. And we mentioned this in the first part of the lecture, the respiratory introduction. So based on the volume that's compromised, we can classify the COPD conditions based on their severity. And here we see there are four levels in total, from mild to very severe. The primary risk, risk factor for COPD is smoking. We know cigarette smoking does a lot of harm directly to the lungs. Other risk factors associated with increased risk for COPD include air pollution, secondhand smoke, those individuals who had repeated infection during their childhood, and those who work with occupational exposures to certain industrial pollutants. COPD is a disease affecting the older population. So for example, people above the age of 45 are more likely to develop COPD. This condition is also positively associated with a low BMI, meaning thin or underweight people are at higher risk for COPD compared to normal BMI individuals. We mentioned chronic bronchitis involves the inflammation of the bronchial tubes. Patients with this condition usually have a productive cough and they are short of breath. So when they do cough, they do produce phlegm, so things are coming up and coming out. To qualify for a formal diagnosis of chronic bronchitis, this is the benchmark here. So the patients need to have these symptoms for at least three months out of the year for at least two or more years. A lot of these patients with bronchitis may have a seasonal flare. For example, the three months that will qualify them for the diagnosis are usually maybe in the winter months when the temperature is colder and depending on the region, there may be more air pollutants due to heating needs, so things like that. For emphysema, remember that this condition is the one that destroys the alveoli at the end of the airway, those small air sacs. The development of emphysema is gradual 
and the inflammation that triggers the destruction can cause increased levels of oxidative stress. And eventually the air sacs collapse and then that part of the volume is not able to be used anymore when we are breathing. The pathophysiology of chronic bronchitis involves generalized inflammation in response to pollutants or other triggers. The cilia function, so those tiny hair-like structures in the airway that propel unwanted cells and other things upward for disposal by coughing, this whole function has been decreased. Therefore, we have more unwanted cells or particles or molecules stuck in the lungs. And this will lead to increased phagocytosis. What we can't cough out, we now have to deal with locally, so that's the reason that we see this increase. And we will actually have an abnormally low level of IgA, so one of those immunoglobulin molecules we've discussed. Since the inflammation is chronic, over time the airway will thicken and then we may have glands that are hyperplastic. So basically they'll be secreting a lot of thickened mucus and the patient will not be able to increase their breathing enough to compensate for these changes. So at the beginning stages, we may just breathe deeper or even faster to try to compensate for all the changes that lead to the decreased vital volume. However, over time, this compensation will not be adequate. So that's when the quality of life declines significantly, and this is due to the constant deprivation of oxygen. Because of that, it's not surprising that a lot of patients with chronic bronchitis have breathing difficulty. They also have low oxygen in the blood along with a higher amount of carbon dioxide in their blood. Due to low oxygen status in the tissue, they may have cyanosis. So if we look at the skin, especially looking at the fingernails here, we can see that it's kind of bluish purplish, which is abnormal. It should be more of a pinkish reddish in a healthy individual. And people with chronic bronchitis might be known as blue bloaters. So their overall appearance may look a little pale, a little blue. They may also have the cyanosis not just on their fingernails, but in their lips is another common place. So they'll look like they have blue lips. Many of those individuals will require supplemental oxygen. And of course that will decrease their quality of life for sure. So imagine they have to have an oxygen tank that they bring with them everywhere, you know, and then have the um, nasula going into their nose so that they can get the oxygen. And many patients with chronic bronchitis, due to the impairment to their lung function, they may eventually develop poor pulmonale, which is the term for heart disease that originates from lung problems. And also they could have left ventricular failure. So these two conditions were mentioned when you studied congestive heart failure. So please review the pathophysiology and the sequence of events from last semester if necessary. Emphysema involves destruction of lung tissue. We already mentioned with the collapse of the VLI sacs, the surface area for breathing is decreased. Also, the decreased production of surfactant is not helping because remember that's the secretion uh, that helps keep the alveoli sacs inflated. Now we don't have enough of this and there will also be more air sacs collapsing during exhalation because during that we are trying to push air out of the lungs and once we push air out then the tiny 
um, alveoli air sacs will not reinflate. So over time, this may lead to a collapsed airway section, and this makes the available surface area smaller. It also traps some dead air inside the lungs, and this is what we call dead volume. So when we conduct an assessment, uh, we would probably see that patients with emphysema have a decreased FEV, and this is not surprising at all. Uh, people with emphysema might be known as pink puffers. Their face may turn a reddish color, and when they breathe, it's like they're puffing because breathing is so difficult for them to do. They have more quicker, more shallow breaths. So we will see breathing difficulty and also breathing difficulty when laying down or orthopnea. In this case, they will always need their head of their bed to be put up to 30 degrees or they may need extra pillows underneath their to torso and head and neck areas. Respiratory acidosis and hypercapnemia, which is the high carbon dioxide in the system, this leads to high carbonic acid, which in turn causes respiratory acidosis. In people with emphysema, their chests have this specific shape over time called the barrel chest, and this is due to the collapse of the alveoli that trap the dead air inside the lungs. So although the barrel chest may make the person look somewhat stocky, if you look at other parts of the body, you can see that, they're, that they are not um, a well-built individual. So for this picture here, we can see that, you know, they look pretty big here around in the chest. But if we're looking, you know, kind of up here at some of the shoulder muscles, um, we can see that this patient is actually probably going through wasting. So it's a very contrasting look when you observe this sign. Patients with emphysema are usually always tired and exhausted. So this can definitely affect oral intake. Since they are short of oxygen, they are tired and more likely they won't be able to sit and eat a full sized meal uninterrupted. To treat emphysema, we need to engage in lifestyle changes. Smoking cessation is key. We really want to remove the primary risk factor for COPD. And if there are known pollutants that exacerbate the symptoms, we want to avoid those as well. So this is a similar treatment that we saw for asthma. We want to remove the trigger or stop the person's exposure to the triggers. Exercising is important, but we need to keep in mind that exercise increases the demand for oxygen and also the demand on our heart. Therefore, if there are already compromised COPD patients, we really need to assess them individually and determine how much exercise these individuals can tolerate. And if they are able to exercise, we definitely want to encourage them uh, to do exercises that will help them over the long term. Nutrition is definitely important in managing the disease. And also, many patients will have to take medications. And remember, these two types of COPD, they are progressive and irreversible, so certain medication re regimens will likely become a lifetime commitment for these patients. So they could be using the bronchodilators. Those um, increase the diameter of the airway. They may be using steroids, which helps relieve inflammation and take away some of the pain. It also can relax the muscle and smooth the muscle uh, that, and the smooth muscle that's on the airway can be relaxed as well. So for antibiotics, uh, with either emphysema or bronchitis, we will have inflammation. 
We have trapped dead air and we can't expel foreign invaders as efficiently. Therefore, the risk for infection increases in these patients. Also, the permanent nature of damage to the pulmonary function likely will require patients to go through pulmonary rehab. And this is a program of education and exercise that helps individuals with COPD manage their breathing problems, helps them to increase their stamina or energy, and also decrease breathlessness.